Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the Re-Envisioning Services Evolving Programming during COVID-19. Um, we're glad to have you here with us and are looking forward to a great day with you here at NUSA for your first session. Yay! Uh, my name is Ruth Ossie. I'm with the City of Fort Worth Community Engagement Office, and I will be your host during this workshop. Uh, before we start, I want to point out all the ways you can share your feedback and ask questions and network with everyone. You don't have to use any of these tools if you don't want to, um, but if you do, they're all great ways to interact with everyone. First, let's take a look at the right-hand side of the screen at your inbox. Uh, when you see a number in green or red pop up, that means someone at the conference has sent you a message to read and you respond the same way. Uh, the next tab down is the chat room. This is where you can network, say hello uh, to Trevor and Jana that are so happy that you're here today. Uh, and introduce yourself, make comments you want everyone to see and share any additional resources about the topic for today's workshop. Um, right underneath that, you'll see the people tabs and this is everybody who is joining us today. Um, again, you can click on their name and chat with them privately. If they're giving you good comments and feedback, please network. Um, this is what this conference is all about. And we want to make sure that you feel um, right, like if it was in person rather than virtual. And last but not least, I want to introduce Trevor and Jana. They're with the Fort Worth Public Library. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to them to introduce themselves. All right. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it a start here. I'm Jana Hill. I'm the Adult Services Manager for the Fort Worth Public Library System. Um, I've been with the City of Fort Worth for just over four years, so kind of new still. And, uh, and um, Trevor and I work really closely together. We are a team, and so I will pass it over to him now. Yeah, my name is Trevor Naughton. I am the Youth Services Manager at the Fort Worth Public Library. I've been here a little over a year. Um, came over from the city of McKinney. All right. All right. Good. Good morning, Mary Lynn. <laughs> See, we've got some some Fort Worth friends in the in the audience. Riverside, California. All right. Nine oh nine. Trevor and his area codes. <laughs> I hope he can. I hope he can uh, make a comment, and and Trevor will tell you your area code. <laughs> so, <laughs> moving on. All right, so how about the library? So founded in 1901, the Fort Worth Public Library serves the 900,000 residents of the city of Fort Worth with 16 physical locations. You can see them on that map there. From a large downtown central library to branches serving neighborhoods, a satellite branch located in a community center. We're about to open a new branch, the Reby Carey Family Library on Fort Worth's east side and La Grande Biblioteca, a new location in La Grande Plaza Shopping Mall. Many people aren't aware that the library is a city department, just like people, just like police or water. Um, I didn't know before, <laughs> before I, I started working in public libraries. I did not realize that. And therefore, we're committed to providing a community service for city residents at the neighborhood level. As with most large library systems, the majority of our employees staff branch libraries with a centralized administration and units that provide system-wide services such as IT, collection management, marketing, and in our case, public programming. Trevor and I represent the two arms of system-wide and therefore city-wide public programming in Fort Worth. In recent years, the library is focused on evolving into what we call a programming library or really a user-centered library where programs for all ages are a core part of our mission. In 2018, we launched a new mission and strategic plan to support the shift and bring the library back out into the community. Let's rewind a bit. So just before the pandemic, <laughs> at the beginning of 2020, we were on the cusp of something great. A brand new adult services unit, my unit, had just been established to focus specifically on the needs and interests of our 650,000 residents over the age of 18. We just hired a new youth services manager, Trevor, to take our programming for children and teens to the next level. And we had a great plan for bringing youth services and adult services teams together and developing this awesome new three-year plan for expanding, expanding programs across the whole city of Fort Worth. And uh, this photo here is from our very popular 
third Thursday jazz concert series at the Central Library. Um, you can see there are about 500 people there. Um, it was a very, very different world very recently. So my first day of working for the city of Fort Worth was March 16th. Uh, my orientation was cut short by five hours as I saw in real time that things were changing quickly, minute to minute, hour to hour. Um, I was able to work in the office for two days before we were sent home to work remotely. So in that two days, I was able to have meet and greets with my staff, uh, get some initial intel on the processes and procedures in place, but a very surface, um level discussions in those two days as we were scrambling to figure out what it was going to look like moving forward it became pretty evident in that short window when i was talking to my team in the building that they were equally relieved that they actually had a manager in place to provide guidance on their future and that they were craving stability uh, my team had gone through several managers um, different programming focuses and implementation strategies and there was a disconnect on how the systems team and the branches were going to be working in the future and pretty much uh, immediately. My team was looking for stability, a blueprint, and a vision. Also, the way my team was structured when I arrived was kind of a collection of small islands operating independently. We had parts of our team officed in different locations. Some were out in community centers. There wasn't a lot of cross collaboration. There was a lack of knowledge of what each staff member was working on and what their teams were working on. We also had a small group of employees that were new to the library world and kind of still learning what constituted a library program. So there was a lot of work to do and the immediacy of our pivot um, provided the spark needed to streamline that work and we began to navigate into the unknown. Yeah, so uh, as, as Trevor kind of mentioned, we we were on a kind of a slow motion shutdown. First, we paused public programming, then we closed to the public, and then we sent staff home. The day that staff, staff were sent home was the first day we offered virtual programming for adults. So, um, and, and I made a note on here that says this is temporary because we really thought this was going to be about a two week um, ordeal. We didn't know that. Um, 14 months, 15 months later, we'd still be talking about this. Um, and then in this photo is um, uh, the library assistant from the from my adult services team, Maria, uh, teaching her Spanish high school equivalency class online. And that is the first program we took virtual. So community needs, even though everything uh, about working felt really, really surreal at that point. In adult services, we knew that the show had to go on. Our immediate pivot to virtual programming was prompted by our Spanish language high school equivalency uh, students who were studying for their upcoming GED exams. We knew we had a commitment to support them. Uh, since the GED exam can make such a difference in a person's career outlook, livelihood, you know, it's, it's not really optional. Uh, you're there because you need it and you're motivated to complete that process. Um, prior to the pandemic, that had been a, an in-person program held at a neighborhood library in East Fort Worth. And so we couldn't just stop the class because um, these folks were counting on us. So we knew that our community needed something to do as well now that so many were locked down at home. So on March 24th, the same day that we began our virtual high school equivalency class, we also launched the Stay at Home Book Club um, which is a completely asynchronous book club that, that lives on Facebook. Um, we don't meet. We don't, uh, there's no obligation to, to show up at any appointed time. We read books together and then, uh, and then use Facebook to talk about them. Um, and in this, in this photo here, uh, this is our director on the right, Monia Shore, talking to uh, the host of Good Morning Texas about that book club which uh, is still very active, still has uh, just under 700 members. And we also began the process of reformatting our existing in-person programs like Spanish Fundamentals and our Spanish, our Spanish Conversation Group, but it was not easy. 
All right, so I mentioned that above all else that my team is looking for stability and what an interesting time to try to build out a plan to provide stability when I think we can all agree that the last 14 months has been pretty unstable. So I really built everything around being accessible and saying you're accessible and being accessible are two widely different things. Um, I know that I have, I'm sure that some of you in the room have worked for someone that has said, come to me anytime you need me, only to find out when you actually need them and come, come to them, they're not around. So I needed to make sure that no matter when someone wanted to pull me in for a chat, a video call, a phone call, to discuss ideas, to vent, to share anxiety, that I was there to listen. Um, accessibility and active listening help create the foundation for stability. I schedule daily one-on-ones with my direct reports and weekly one-on-ones with their direct reports to make sure that we continue to be aligned and I could provide clarity when I had it. Um, when I didn't have clarity, I needed everyone to be comfortable with hearing I don't know and we're just going to make the best decision at that action point that we could and reevaluate at the next action point. And I think that Jana can agree, we just got a series of Gatling gun action points one after another, and we were just doing our best to make the best decision at that time. Um, we needed to totally change the way we discussed ideas and program proposals. So we developed a regular schedule of roundtables where we discussed ideas and proposals. Um, it was paramount that we developed a culture of feedback, especially as we entered a world that was new to most of us we had to start making feedback a regular practice. Um, we needed to stop personalizing it and start embracing it and looking for it. Um, obviously that is much easier said than done. I can tell you that the first few meetings when my team was taking live fire, the feedback was ugly. I could read on their body language and their face that they were having a hard time processing. Um, I let them knew, know wherever they were individually as it related to their comfort in taking and receiving feedback was where they were supposed to be. So differentiating was really important, um, but we needed to kind of continue to um, provide that feedback and really get more and more comfortable taking and receiving it. Um, that was the driver to building up the skills necessarily, uh, necessary for us to create our online content. We then needed to create a roadmap for our virtual programming that allowed adaptability and tweaks when needed. We needed to remain nimble and flexible. I'm sure everyone here um, heard those two words constantly over the last 14 months. Um, we really needed to put it into practice, but this allowed us to explore new ideas, um, try the same program at different times and days, expand our offerings to different target audiences, um, test out different platforms for presenting our programs. Uh, we also needed to assess our individual levels of experience and comfort. Um, I mean, no, everyone in the room is gonna be very shocked to hear this, but most of us in the library world did not enter the library field to be on camera and to be broadcast over the internet to be consumed by mass uh, number of people. We are, we are a shy group. So um, everyone entered at different levels of on-camera comfort at different levels of tech skills as related to making video, editing video, access to recording equipment. We were remote, so we were really dealing with what we had for our personal cells and uh, work laptops. Um, again, differentiation and embracing that everyone was entering the project at a different spot on the timeline and that no matter the entry point, that's where they needed to be. We were measuring improvement intervals from that entry point um, individually, not as a uh, not as a sweeping hole. Okay. And I, I don't know if this is the case for you guys, but I'm not seeing everything on our PDF. So just know there should have been bullet points on the on the last one and an image on this one. But that's okay. We'll just talk through it. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, we realized early on that we would need to approach serving adults. <laughs> yeah, adaptability and practice. This this is really like every day for us. Um, we realized really early on that we'd have to approach serving adults and youth really differently. For adults, we focused on live interactive programs that gave folks something to do, something to get their mind off of what was going on in the world at the time. 
So we, we can't forget how how scary last spring was. It, it was, uh, I mean, we, we keep saying the word unprecedented, but really no one was, was prepared to deal with this, not just at work, but emotionally, it was really challenging. So our focus was building a sense of community and combating the sense of isolation so many people were feeling early on in the pandemic. We experimented with topics, platforms, pre-recorded mm -hmm. concepts, and finally landed on a mix of of live virtual, um, lifelong learning. So that's all of our classes and things like that. And literary programs. So author visits and uh, book clubs and things via Zoom and Instagram. And pre-recorded music pro programs and performances um, because we discovered that uh, streaming live music has its own inherent challenges um, that we really needed to, to mitigate by pre-recording. And so uh, this photo should be uh, Rita, our music librarian, in a conversation with members of a local chamber music group. Just imagine that. So for youth services, our initial jump into virtual content were a series of very short three to four minute craft videos and reader's advisory videos. And reader's advisory being book recommendations for specific age groups. Um, they were good launching points but they really didn't capture what the in-house, in-person program experience was. So while these videos were really important for us to build up those skills and that comfort, there wasn't really a direct translation between those quick hit videos and what we were offering before we started working remotely. Um, we also initially focused strictly on pre-recorded on-demand content. Uh, we felt that this allowed families to engage and access our programming around their busy schedules um, and that they would live on our social media for new families learning about our virtual offerings they could go back and revisit and watch what they may have missed so just like anything the more we practiced and the more we met and the more we discussed ideas you will notice this is a big theme for me i'm talking more about the process than the actual program itself the more comfortable we got with digital content um, we reached a point, um, an evolution point, to where we started to ask, how can we leverage the team's unique passions, strengths, backgrounds, and experience into a larger collaborative project? And the answer was a program that we call Learn, Dream, Do. And that's essentially a school-aged variety show. Um, think Sesame Street, 321 Contact, um, and instead of seasoned on-camera professionals, a bunch of librarians kind of learning on the fly, um, where we focused on a different theme each episode. Uh, we decided to take all the individual shorter quick hit videos that we were previously making and turn those into a cohesive collaborative project. So each week we'd have a round table, we'd talk through everyone's contributions, we'd provide feedback on the individual videos, discuss upcoming themes, things they'd like to do. Um, the structure of Learn, Dream, Do not only allowed us to showcase the wide array of talent that we had internally, but it was a natural driver to create and reestablish relationships with city and community partners. Um, they were all new relationships to me, which was good kind of revisiting this um, from a system level, but to have people come on as guests and talk about their field, talk about their profession, talk about their organization. Um, it, was, it was a natural fit to um, strengthen and build those relationships. And the more people we talked to and the more people we worked with, we realized that you know, we were all in the same boat. We were all trying to adapt and make it work. And um, we were all kind of learning collectively together um, in different buildings, but on a very similar timeline. So we really developed a evolution of those singular quick hit videos and piece them together with a theme um, in a larger collaborative into like a 25 minute Sesame Street type program. We also began to explore live Zoom programming. Um, something that I still miss and I know my staff missed was the lack uh, was the direct engagement with families. Um, leading a story time or music and movement and having those conversations before and after a program is some of the best experiences you can have working in a library. And while we enjoyed communicating with families through Facebook posts and YouTube comments, there's really nothing like that live interaction. So we knew that adult services had already 
begun and established live programming. So we started to ask them questions about best practices, um, strategies, best days and times. And obviously we would tweak those based on success. And we started to launch weekly family engagement programs. And those were kinder prep 101 classes. So for in pre-K prep classes. So for families that are getting their kids ready for one of those two entry points, um, we had an eight week program that was drop in. You didn't need to go to all eight where they could come in and, you know, learn about ways that they can create a reading nook in their house to foster a love of literacy at a, at a young age. Um, we also started doing live story times through Zoom for toddler and pre-K. Um, our youth librarians have so much fun doing those. So with these evolutions taking place and the excitement level of the team continuing to rise, um, I had to hammer home the message that we needed to approach this with patience. It would be fantastic if the very first video that we did got 50,000 views and it got wild engagement and went viral and everyone across the world saw the Fort Worth Public Library Learn, Dream, Do, Apples for President show. But we need to take time to build an audience. Um, and I wanted them to be more concerned with the planning and the collaborative nature of creating the program than the number of people who were attending or watching, at least initially. We needed to build a presence and be consistent. And once we found those windows, days, times, then we would start to see that growth. But until we really started to solidify those days and times and that presence, the important thing was the creation. Um, if we planned it well, if we thought about community needs, um, if we were towing that fine line between empathy and honesty when providing feedback, we would. That's the those are the key ingredients to developing an audience. And we are starting to see that take shape. Um, probably the last five or six months, we are we are seeing a steady increase in programming participation. Well, and I'll say just uh, as an aside for, for my preschooler, um, those programs have been wonderful during the pandemic. And, and you can just, um, I'd love being able to put it on the YouTube playlist and know, know it's quality content coming through my TV, uh, trusted, exciting, just great material. So programming partners. Um, because we already had um, skilled presenters, because that's what um, our our kind our flavor of librarian does, we we program. So we're we're used to being in front of people and presenting all the time. Um, because we already have that skill set, an educational mindset, and newly developed expertise with virtual platforms, <laughs> um, we almost immediately started collaborating with other city departments to reach the nearly 7,000 employees of the city of Fort Worth and the community at large. So in adult services, we partnered with a diver the diver diversity and inclusion department and the city employee Juneteenth committee to create a multi-part Juneteenth virtual event to stand in for the in-person festival normally held at city hall. And uh, a highlight you see here in the photo was a performance by local musician and music historian, Brandy Pace on African-American roots music. Uh, that's on our YouTube, you should go watch it, it's amazing. Um, we also partnered with the Departments of Neighborhood Services, Economic Development, and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to present during the Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, Trevor's team developed virtual story times, the staff from the Fort Worth Nature Center and Adult Services collaborated on historical crafting with the Log Cabin Village, that's uh, Fort Worth's um, local historical park with log cabins brought in from around the area um, and preserved um, with historical interpreters and it's it's pretty great um, and both of those are part of the parks department so that was a, another big uh, internal partner and then an adult services uh, staff member provided a virtual Spanish fundamentals class especially for city employees as a professional development opportunity. That was something that was supposed to happen in person and obviously couldn't, um, but we moved it, we moved it online uh, with the goal of being able to better serve our Spanish speaking communities.
And just kind of doubling back on partnerships, I really wanted us to constantly be thinking big, big ideas. Um, so we partnered with the University of Maine for a Maker 101 observatory class. We reached out to an astronaut in Houston for our Hispanic Heritage Learn Dream Do. Um, we didn't just think local, we obviously made local and city partnerships work, but we, we thought on a national scale of, of what would be an enriching experience, who could bring value and knowledge to our programs. Um, it, it was really a beautiful thing to kind of see take off. So, um, what are we at now? We are at the show must go on. So hitting your stride is a really good feeling because it implies that you're kind of busting your butt, but you don't feel like you are. And to my team's credit, I put a lot on their plate and kept them planning and I kept them filming and I kept them providing feedback at every turn. Um, we hit our stride when we began to expand. So not just our expansion of programming offerings, but expand who would contribute to our programs. So obviously my team is a systems team and we work with all of the branches, but we have branch staff that were hired to do programming that just weren't able to do it at for the last 14 months. And we wanted to figure out and build out a process where they could get trained and they could contribute towards the virtual programming to make it a system-wide um, effort. So we needed to start incorporating them. We knew that they wanted to. So we leveraged out our internal learning process and created a series of onboarding training programs that branch staff could opt into that not only would train them on the ins and outs of creating virtual programs, but um, at the end of that training, they would create their own mini program for the system. So one of these was called Think Outside the Box Thursday. Um, this training was essentially built out so you learn the basics of recording equipment, best practices for recording yourself, how to get the best quality sound, how to upload that file to our communications department. Um, they were assigned a peer within our team for a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. They met regularly to ask questions. They were given feedback on their content and then we asked them to provide feedback to us about the training so it, it, it was always and constantly a two-way thing and the end result was a five to six minute think outside the box art video um, and these videos are essentially it starts out with a shape so like this is not a pizza piece of pizza and then you turn that shape into a different creation so maybe that piece of pizza turns into um, a tooth in the mouth of a shark, and at the end, it's not a piece of pizza, it's a shark, right? So we walk through that creative process and kind of ask kids to kind of use their creativity to kind of think outside the box to create something. So at the end of that training, not only have they worked with systems and developed a relationship and been introduced to the culture of feedback that we were trying to build internally and then system-wide, but they were able to get their um entry-level skills into virtual content and have a tangible output at the end of it that they'd be proud of and they could see posted on our channels we also did something very similar with our story time training so um, from a system-wide level we needed to establish quality standards across the system um, early literacy tips and book selections and um essentially we, we we need to get to a point where a story time at one branch looks the same as a story time at the other. I mean, the personalities of the people giving them is going to be different, but the elements and the goals need to be consistent. So we created an opt-in at the end of the traditional story time training for those that wanted to do a virtual story time training. So it was a reinforcement, again, of the basic tech skills. They were assigned a mentor. Um, they were, again, we modeled the culture of feedback. It was a two-way conversation and they were able to create um, virtual story times for our Let's Create program. Yeah, and in adult services, we we did some similar things, um, again, with a slightly different approach where we had branch staff come and basically be embedded in adult services um, where they would work with us for a few weeks at a time, um, learn the difference in uh, the branch kind of neighborhood experience versus the experience of working at a system-wide level where we serve everyone in the city um, and, and try to really um, um, 
customized programs for, for all the various audiences we serve. Um, and one of the great benefits of it has been that we've been able to really, really uh, complement the skill sets we already had on our team. So some of the staff that have been embedded with us um, were bilingual and have helped us develop quite a bit more Spanish language programming than we would have been able to do. Um, we have some right now. Uh, we'll be rolling out some Spanish language workforce programs and uh, small business programs this summer that I'm really excited about. And we're able to do it because we've we've been able to tap into that skill set in the branches. So we um, embrace trial and error throughout this entire process. Um, we found that some of our programs, um, while they were designed with intent, didn't have the same success as others. Uh, we created a library office hour program for families to ask questions about library resources and troubleshoot ebooks and catalog issues. And we just didn't get a ton of engagement. We did get good feedback from those who attended. So we decided to roll elements from the office hours and some other frequently asked questions into other programming plans. But as a standalone, it just didn't work. Um, live afternoon programming for teens had very little engagement. We initially designed our Maker 101 program, which is a tween teen take and make kit to have a pre recorded element and then a live follow up um, to create that engagement, to allow staff to assist with any issues or ask any questions or to show off what they made from, from their kit. Um, Again, designed with intent, didn't meet the community need. Um, in our live programs, we let people in the virtual room, uh, we let them in early to have conversations and leave the room open at the end of the program for follow-up. Um, we are trying to find ways to collect as much qualitative data as possible. Those conversations, my experience working the floor, working a circulation desk, working information desk, is that having conversations with patrons, they're gonna share so much important qualitative data about what they're looking for, um, what they'd like to see the library offer. You just need to be intentional and deliberate in identifying it and sharing it with the right person. So for example, I was at a, I was doing a music and movement class. So that's like a three to five year old program where we're just dancing and using manipulatives. And it's just a, it's a 45 minute workout. Um, and at the end of the program, um, we're cleaning up and I'm talking to some, some of the families in there. And one of the dads says that he was excited that the weather was getting nice. He couldn't wait to get grilling again, start grilling, um, but he didn't really know how to make a brisket. He said, I wish that you know someone would come and show me how to make a proper brisket. So in that one interaction at a three to five-year-old music and movement class, that piece of information was turned into a Pitmaster 101 class a few months later, where we had a local Pitmaster at a famous barbecue place here in North Texas a uh, tender smokehouse came out. We partnered with Big Green Egg and we showed people how to pick, trim, smoke, cut, season their brisket. And we got, you know, 65 year old, uh, 60, 65 um, people. And, you know, we're talking older men uh, that may have not been in the library since or before that program. So it's just kind of identifying and using that qualitative information. Obviously, we're also tracking attendance data. Uh, the key is putting together the quantitative and the qualitative to best inform the future plans. And then we also um, utilize, we have Beanstack, which is kind of a, a, um, it's a platform for our summer reading. And we create our summer reading to not only track minutes, but to create kind of unique activity challenges that route families to our pre-existing virtual program. So. Um, one of the programs this summer for teens, it's, it's all about being a maker. And one of those, one of the activities is watch our Maker 101 program virtually share with us one thing that you learned. And then it also directs them to the catalog for extension learning through, through books and just kind of anything that we can do to kind of pinball people back and forth between resources and programs. And we're just trying to be deliberate about about getting that cross-functionality. Yeah, so it's it's really rewarding um, for me when I'm doing a live program and somebody asked me in the chat, um, 
hey, what's what's the activity code for this? I need to put it in in Beanstack to get my to get my credit to get my summer reading prize. So I, I love that kind of uh, um, it, you know indicator that that people are finding us that way. And then you know at the at the end of summer reading last year, we did um, uh, an outcomes survey of the adults who'd participated in the summer reading program. And we got some really great um, hard data, but but just reinforcement that that the way we were structuring those activities was really uh, welcome and appreciated. And um, you know, even adults like an assignment, and they like to be exposed to new things in their community, whether that's an event they didn't know about, or you know, an, an exhibition, or a geocaching along the river, or something like that, or you know, library programs that they might not have found out other found out about otherwise, when they see it in that summer reading app, um, they they really like that kind of uh, guidance, tour guide through the summer. So why are we talking about this now? Um, so the past 14 months have ultimately given us um, a really rare opportunity to pause what we were doing and really think about why and how we were doing it. Um, our teams have learned so much more about the workings of city government as we began working more and more with other city departments. Um, it can it can be very easy to just know how, you know, be in a um, position where you really only know how the library functions. Um, but it's been really educational and helpful for us to know how the library fits in the city um, as part of a bigger municipal government ecosystem. Um, we've also learned a lot about our team members' skills and interests, as Trevor has said, um, and been able to really help them flex their creative muscles. So um, uh, the, the photo you see there is our music librarian, Rita, at our, um, it was a major event. That was our virtual New Year's Eve uh, concert event called Amplified New Year's Eve. And uh, the excite one of the exciting things about that um, was a, giving people something cool to do on New Year's Eve when uh, a lot of folks didn't feel like they could go out safely. Um, um, we got to flex a lot of our creative muscles in figuring out what this kind of variety show should look like. Um, we brought artists and bands into the library to perform um, at night. We made it a whole um, uh, nighttime uh, extravaganza. And I, I don't know of any other libraries who've done quite that. Um, and it was, it was definitely a leap for us, but it was a really good one. And, uh, and um, you know, made us really realize um, what kind of assets we had in our own staff. So I know, you know, in this one, Rita really knocked it out of the park. And, and here she's uh, doing some emceeing, which was a little out of her comfort zone, I know. But she, she did a great job and, and learned so much about the kind of video production side of, of, of virtual programming. And so um, with changes in our departmental structure, we have a lot better understanding now of not only how youth and adult services complement each other and work together, um, but how that relationship plays out in the branches and in the community. And maybe most of all, I think, um, is that we're able to apply the lessons we learned to training branch staff and new hires to be stronger programmers, to serve all of our neighbors in Fort Worth, um, when when we're programming out uh, in person in the branches again. So everything we've learned over the last 14 months, and it has been a, definitely an, an, an intense 14 months, we are sharing out with uh, with everyone else, all of our trial and error, we are we are um, sparing them the errors and just uh, helping them hopefully reap, reap some of those benefits. So big takeaways, the first one is that virtual isn't gonna go anywhere. Um, we're gonna continue, or really actually we're going to morph into a hybrid model and constantly be calibrating what the percentage of virtual to in-person looks like. Um, we're trying to meet people where they're at. Um, it's kind of a component of library outreach and by programming virtually, we can reach people um, whether they live in an area with a service gap or whether they don't wanna to go to the library that day because it's raining 
Um, I mean, there's a lot of elements at play every, any given day that um, can can really sway the amount of people that come to the library to participate in your program. So um, we don't want to speculate on a um, wide ranging comfort level of returning to in-person programming. We want to offer programming in different ways and different platforms for everybody so we can provide the the, the skills and learning and resources for, for the entire city and surrounding areas. Um, our culture of feedback is is not going anywhere and this was such a perfect mechanism to build it out. Um, collectively, we have stepped outside our comfort zone to create our virtual programming. We're gonna have to step even further outside of it as we create this new morph and we ask the branches to buy into this new way of programming, um, this new way of thinking about how we program, how we discuss our proposals, how we think about outcomes and versus outputs, how we think about community needs, right? And this is going to be a drastic change, but we have proof positive that stepping outside your comfort zone and making that change has great rewards. So we'll always have this experience. Um, it also has kind of created um, peer to peer leaders on me and Janet's team of all the times we've worked with branch staff of developing those relationships and that trust and that support system. I mean, that's everything that Jana and my team do is for supporting the branches to give them all the tools and knowledge to have a successful slate of programs. This has set that up. It has put it on a T. So that's the next step is kind of creating and cementing and stabilizing that bridge between system and branches. Um, it shows you that the more you talk about your ideas and the more you think about your community and the more feedback that you get, it, it pays off tenfold. The more time you give a program to be discussed instead of planning seven days out, if, you, if you're planning three months out and you're having multiple discussions about an idea that can only um, strengthen the quality of what you want to do. Um, and, you know, everything that we do, we try to um, build out programming and offerings to benefit the community. And by being having a virtual presence and an in-person presence, we have different channels and different ways of reaching and having conversations with, with our families and, and our patrons and getting valuable input and data that kind of lead us in the right direction and we'll just revisit and reevaluate at each action point. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's exciting. It's 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 been a, a wild 14, 15 months. Yeah, and uh, on the on the the first point about virtual not going anywhere um, before COVID, it it was a virtual programming was a maybe a twinkle in my eye. It was something I had hoped for in the future because I had a little bit of a background in that already. Um, but it, it seemed, uh, I won't say insurmountable, but it, it seemed very challenging. And, and this, um, for better or worse, the pandemic was the catalyst that got all of that moving. And I, I think we're, we're certainly at a point with adults where um, having a, a more virtual programming presence is an expectation. Um, it's not a luxury anymore. It's just part of how we do business. We've always recognized in adult services that we have a little bit of a different situation. So um, for for Trevor's crew, um, you know, parents are going to bring kids to libraries. Um, they want them to read. They want them to participate with things. They they want them to do these activities. And, and everybody knows from, when, from their own childhood um, the, you know, the library is a, a great place for kids to, to come have, have a great time and learn and um, participate. But for adults, um, you have to really give them what they want and need um, and what, meet them where they are, literally, because no one's going to drive them to the library. <laughs> no one's going to say, you need this and drive them there. So they have to, you know, they have to, to have the motivation and the um, interest to be able to um, balance their lives and, and make time for whatever's happening at the library. 
Um, I, I'm a busy parent. Life is complicated. And I love the shift to virtual. There are times I just, you just can't leave the house. Um, and it's a, I think it's a really great opportunity. I know for our high school equivalency students, um, while they were definitely um, a little anxious about the transition at first, so many of them are moms of younger children. They realized how much easier it was to participate in the virtual class because they didn't have to find childcare. They could just um, have the kid in the next room, um, you know, playing or whatever and do their class and, you know, achieve, make that achievement without having to find childcare multiple days a week. Um, it's a, it's a really big difference. So that's definitely a, a mode we'll continue in. All right. So I think we are ready for questions. And I, I see we have one and I think I can, I can address that if you want me to go ahead, Ruth. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to that you okay. guys have, um, I think, one of the best marketing strategies in the city. So if I know you don't work specifically um, in that department in that area, but if you could share a little bit of what great things the library does in, in that spectrum, I think that would be really cool. Yeah. So um, the first question was, do you anticipate permanently keeping some of the virtual offerings like the book club in addition to returning to former plans and job descriptions? Absolutely. So the book club is not going anywhere. It's called the stay at home book club, <laughs> whether anyone's staying home or, or not anymore. Um, it's, it is thriving. It's very active. Um, it's really popular because we, they choose the books. So I'll, I'll be doing this later today. Um, every few weeks I put up a poll I, with five options of books to choose from. They pick their book. Um, we all read it together and then we move on to the next one. And I, I think that's a mode that will work even uh, when people are out and about in the world. Um, and we also have a very popular Tuesday night trivia program that's on Zoom. Um, it's a Zoom webinar, so I can't, I'm hosting it. Um, I can't see the participants. And I think they like that. They're, they're a little incognito. Um, you don't have to look, you don't have to look nice because there's no cameras and no mics, but they've developed this really great community just through the chat. Um, we have so many repeat um, players that they know each other. They know each other by name. They talk to each other in the chat and, and know each other well enough to, to kind of tease each other, which is just not something you see, uh, you know, out in library programs that much, at least in a city of this size. So that's been amazing. And they ask me, if not weekly, um, at least a couple times a month, this isn't going away when we're back in person, is it? No. Trivia is staying. Trivia is staying as long as, as you want. Um, and so, Trevor, do you want to talk about marketing virtual offerings? Uh, yeah. So our communications department also went through a transition in the last 14 months and we're short staffed. And I think that now that we're kind of full, getting closer to fully staffed in different departments, that we are going to have a bit more of a... Um, citywide promotion for everything that we got cooking right we were kind of not only were we learning how to program and uh what the audiences we wanted to reach but how we wanted to go about um promoting it i mean obviously the the bread and butter is in-house promotion at the libraries and we just weren't open to the public for a large amount of time and we have been playing around with um different ways to spread the word um we can for sure get you on a mailing list um, to keep you updated and anyone else that would like to get on there programming coming up for adults and youth um, soon that will um, sometime in the fall that will have in person and virtual um, but yeah i mean i think that that has been one of the puzzles we've been trying to put together we've been trying to figure out the, the most effective way to create awareness and marketing for it um, also understanding that when when someone logs in online they have about two trillion options for um content to consume right so it's it's a it's a difficult marketplace to compete in um so it's kind of a vague answer it's 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 um you can be assured that we are still trying to maximize um awareness for what we're doing because 
because we feel pretty strongly that we're doing some unique and, and fun things. And in our in our live programs, um, something we've we've kind of baked into our our process um, in adult services is uh, especially live ones like the trivia that are a, a weekly um, you know repeating program. I know my audience in there, and I know what's coming up that they're going to be interested in. So while they're um, logging in to trivia on Tuesday, I take a couple minutes while they're getting settled to just talk about the programs that are coming up in the next week that I think they'll be interested in. Um, they're my captive audience, and you know uh, it takes a second to get all, to get everything set up the way you want it. So I might as well take that time um, with a kind of specially crafted pitch to them. Um, and I, I know the rest of of uh, adult services does the same thing. Um, we we really try to to be very conscious of what audience we have um, in a particular program and really cross promote with them. If we know it's a lot of parents, we will cross promote youth services programs um, and, and vice versa. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a dotted line between, between youth and adults. So we just try to be really mindful and take all of those opportunities where we can. Couple of questions over in the question tab. Um, when a bug is selected, do they purchase their own? And then did you provide pickup for low income families? see. Trevor, did you catch that? Is she asking about uh, for the stay at home book club? I believe so. Yes. So she's asking if uh, do they have to how do they go about getting uh, their book to participate in the in the club? That's a really good question. So when we started the book club, um, the libraries were were closed, you couldn't get print materials for a, little, a very short period of time. Um, was the Fort Worth Public Library reopened um, nearly a year before other big libraries in Texas, uh, kind of shockingly, um, but we're, we're proud of that. But there was a, a short period of time where you couldn't get print materials um, before we had curbside or anything like that. So we make a very conscious effort. Um, I make a very conscious effort. I work with our collection management uh, department, who the ones who actually buy the books and, and make sure that you know we have what we need. Um, all of the books are available electronically, so you can get them. I only offer books that you can get in ebook or audiobook and or audiobook um, because we have a lot of audiobook fans in that book club. And um, they're all available on Overdrive, which is our digital library platform. Um, and I make sure to choose books that we have unlimited licenses for. So we have so many readers in that group um, with digital book licensing. A lot of the time you can only have one copy or two copies of a particular title. So I only choose titles where I can have an unlimited uh, pool of, of copies available to uh, meet the needs of that group. So, um, so when we do that, uh, everybody knows to go download their book. We do have a lot of members who aren't in Fort Worth. We have members across the country. We have members in other countries. Um, and they know that their libraries may not have the exact same um, offerings that, that we do. Some of them will get it in a print version from their library. I know there are probably some who order from Amazon, but they don't tell me. <laughs> so, um, so you know, there are, there are lots of options. Um, and, and the ones who aren't in Fort Worth proper with a Fort Worth library card know that, they're, that their options might be a little different uh, within Fort Worth. But for our own residents, we make it as easy as we possibly can. Question was, did you provide a pickup for low income families? Um, so pick up for like, like an outreach opportunity or to pick up books that they want to be returned or. It may be pick up um, for, for books during the pandemic. So I don't, don't know if you touched on that, but if you want to expand. So it, it may not directly, I'm, I'm not sure quite what the question is asking, but so I'm going to make a stab at it. And if I'm wrong, just tell me. Um, so while we were closed for the pandemic, um, and, and this was the case for library, at least the large library systems across Texas, um, we we're a fines free library already. So um, we made sure when we shut things down 
and when things were really challenging, that no books were due while we were shut down. Um, and, um, you know, even beyond that, we don't charge library fines, um, except, you know, fees for, you know, replacements and such like that, if uh, books are lost, but no late fees um, anytime. But we also made things not due during the pandemic. So there, there wouldn't be a um, mad rush to get, you know, worried about getting your late books in on time. And I know other other library systems in the state waived waived library fines during that time. So people and changed due dates. So people weren't uh, so worried about getting getting things back in on time if they couldn't make it to the library or didn't feel like they should make it to the library. So we got clarification on the question and it was any activities okay. that required specific materials. Yeah, so for like the the let's create story time kits and the maker 101 kits, we made those available at all of our branches across the system. So 16 branches where you could pick them up curbside or you could pick them up when those branches actually open to the public. Um, I think that last month we distributed about 500 uh, of the story time kits and 200 of the Maker 101 kits. Those are obvious. Everything that we do is built around free and open access. Mm -hmm. um, and if they weren't able to get in there, we designed um, the kits. And in the video, we discuss um, different options for things that they may have around the house. So if you weren't able to get there to pick up the sack, we, there's a there's a um, a variety of different things you can swap out to still participate and engage with it. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really mindful of that. Um, this library programs themselves are always free and always open to the public. We never charge for library programs. Um, we try to, to make the, we try to eliminate any burdens to participating. So we do, um, like Trevor says with the SACs, we do um, what we call in libraries, they used to be called uh, uh, make and take, where you come to the library, make a craft and take it with you. Well, we've, we've had to flip it as an industry, and now it's, it's take and make. So you take the kit, you make it at home. We give you instructions, um, and, and uh, it's great. So, so we do a very similar kind of kit. Um, we distribute them to the branches for adults, and you can just pick them up. So we've done... We've done wildflower seeds. We'll be doing some bookmarks, um, some some candle uh, crafts, and things like that. And you get the you get everything you need in a little pack. Um, the most you'll need is maybe some scissors or, or something um, really basic. And if we you know if we if we get a situation where lots of um, we have a lot of demand <laughs> um, and we run out, we we're really mindful about structuring. Uh, and selecting those those activities where if we run out of kits and you want to go get your own, it's not going to be an expensive um, group of supplies. You're probably going to have most of the supplies at home. And if you don't, um, you know, any purchase would be really minimal. But we really do try to try to cover it ourselves with those kits. And so a, a, another example as we're kind of transitioning back to in-person, the summer we'll be doing outdoor programs. So in-person, but outside. And one of those is going to be a nature journaling program that I'm very excited about. Um, but I know, um, cause I, I have an art background, art supplies are really expensive. So we're going to be, um, everyone who participates gets a, gets a sketchbook. They just need to bring their own pencils or, or pens, which most people are going to have around the house. Uh, but we'll, we'll provide the sketchbook for everybody who attends. So we really do try to balance it out, um, that way and, and, uh, eliminate that, uh, barrier. I am not seeing any more questions. So, Jana and Trevor, I just want to thank you all for your time this morning and for being here with us at NUSA. We really appreciate it. Um, this session will be recorded. So, if you want to come back and look at it after the uh, conference is over, you'll just be able to click on the room and it'll play on demand. Um, to get back to the lobby, you can just press at the button, the button, sorry, at the top left corner. And you have a few minutes until the next conference starts at 11.15, or the next workshop, sorry. Okay. Thank you again, Dan and Trevor. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.